Hello students, welcome to the lecture on trade tariff and non-tariff barriers and after this lecture we will be able to learn the following objectives. Discuss non-tariff barriers, types and use. Define use of non-tariff barriers instead of tariffs. Describe GATT and non-tariff barriers. Explain the anti-dumping. Let's start with the concept of trade barriers, tariff and non-tariff barriers. Restrictions on international trade, primarily in the form of non-tariff barriers, have multiplied rapidly in the 1980s. For example, began restricting automobile exports to the United States in 1981. One year later, the U.S. government, as part of its ongoing intervention in the sugar market, imposed quotas on sugar imports. The increasing use of protectionist trade policies raises national as well as international issues. As many observers have noted, international trade restrictions generally have costly national consequences. The net benefits received by protected domestic producers, that is benefits reduced by lobbying costs, tend to be outweighed by the losses associated with excessive production and restricted consumption of the protected goods. Protectionist trade policies also cause foreign adjustments in production and consumption that risk retaliation by the affected country. As a type of protectionist policy, non-tariff barriers produce the general consequences identified. However, there are numerous reasons besides the proliferation to focus attention solely on non-tariff barriers. Non-tariff barriers encompass a wide range of specific measures, many of whose effects are not easily measured. For example, the effects of a government procurement process that is biased towards domestic producers are difficult to quantify. In addition, many non-tariff barriers discriminate among a country's trading partners. This discrimination violates the most favoured nation principle, a cornerstone of the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, GATT, the multinational agreement governing international trade. Not only does the most favoured nation principle require that a country treat its trading partners identically, but it also requires that trade barriers reductions negotiated on a bilateral basis be extended to all GATT members. By substituting bilateral discriminatory agreements for multilateral approaches to trade negotiations and dispute settlements, countries raise doubts about the long-term viability of GATT. Let us now discuss the non-tariff barriers, the types and use. A tariff is a tax imposed on foreign goods as they enter a country. Non-tariff barriers, on the other hand, are non-tax measures imposed by governments to favor domestic over foreign suppliers. Non-tariff barriers encompass a wide range of measures. Some have relatively unimportant trade effects. Quotas. A quota is simply a maximum limitation specified in either value or physical units on imports of a product for a given period. It is enforced through licenses issued to either importers or exporters and may be applied to imports from specific countries or from foreign countries generally. Two examples illustrate these different characteristics. The United States imposes a general quota on dried milk imports. Licenses are granted to certain U.S. trading organizations who are allowed to import a maximum quantity of dried milk based on the previous imports. Voluntary export restraints and the multiplier arrangement. Voluntary export restraints, which are nearly identical to quotas, are agreements between an exporting and an importing country limiting the maximum amounts of exports in either value or quantity terms to be sold within a given period. Characterizing these restraints as voluntary is somewhat misleading because they are frequently designed to prevent official protective measures by the important country. For example, exports by the Japanese automobile industry to the United States and the United Kingdom have been limited voluntarily to prevent the governments of these countries from directly limiting imports of Japanese autos. Non-automatic import authorizations Non-automatic import authorizations are non-tariff barriers in which the approval to import is not granted freely or automatically. There are two general categories of non-automatic licensing discretionary licensing, often called liberal licensing. It occurs when importer's government must approve a specific import. However, precise conditions to ensure approval are not specified. Frequently, this form of licensing is used to administer quantitative limits. Under the current restraints on U.S. imports of steel, a domestic user can request authorization to exceed the maximum import limitation if the specific product is unavailable domestically at a reasonable cost. 
Variable Import Levies Variable import levies are special charges set to equalize the import price of a product with a domestic target price. The levies are variable so that as world price of a product fails or rises, the levy rises falls. The result is that price changes in the world market will not affect directly the domestic market. These measures are an integral aspect of the European Community's common agricultural policy. For example, in March 1987, the European Community's price for wheat was $8.53 per bushel, while the world price was $1.95 per bushel. Prospective importers were faced with a levy of $6.58 per bushel. Now, moving on to the next topic, we will study the use of non-tariff barriers instead of tariffs. Since non-tariff barriers have been used increasingly in recent years, an obvious question is why non-tariff barriers rather than tariff barriers have become so popular. A review by Deerdorf concludes that there currently is no definitive answer to this question. However, numerous reasons have been suggested. The impact of GATT an institutional constraint on the use of tariffs, GATT is an institution whose original mission was to restrict the use of tariffs. Given this constraint, policymakers willing to respond to protectionist demands were forced to use non-tariff devices. Thus, non-tariff barriers are simply a substitute for tariffs. In fact, research by Ray indicates that non-tariff barriers have been used to reverse the effects of multilateral tariff reductions negotiated under the GATT. Certainty of domestic benefits. Deirdrof suggests that non-tariff barriers are preferred to tariffs because policy policymakers and demanders of protection believe that the effects of tariffs are less certain. This perception could be due to various reasons, some real and some illusionary. For example, it may be much easier to see that a quota of 1 million limits automobile imports to 1 million than to demonstrate conclusively that a tariff of say $300 per car would result in imports of only 1 million automobiles. Benefits to other parties The supply and the demand analysis of quotas and voluntary exports restraints highlights the difference per unit of import between what domestic and foreign consumers pay. This price differential reflects the extent of the gains that are available for some group to appropriate. With tariffs, the price differential is compared by the domestic government in the form of tariff revenue. Now, I don't want to give anyone the false impression that tariffs are out of control. In fact, on average, tariffs on traded goods are lower than they were at any point in the 20th century. Let me give you a little background first. In the 1920s, when Herbert Hoover was running for office, he made a campaign promise to U.S. farmers to protect them from foreign competition if he was elected to office. Once he was elected, he needed legislative support to get a bill moving through Congress. Getting started wasn't so bad. Legislators from farming states were more than happy to sponsor such a bill. But that wasn't enough votes to actually get it passed. So what do you do if you're seeking support for farming protection bill from people who care nothing about farming? What if, for example, you're approaching a representative from Detroit? How do you make the proposed bill more interesting? Add a line or two about protecting automakers, perhaps? And so it went. A little something for car makers, furniture producers, textile manufacturers. In the end, the Smoot-Hawley bill entailed protection for over 20,000 U.S. products. Now, other countries in the world weren't sitting idly by as Smoot-Hawley was making its rounds. They were, to say the least, rather unhappy at the prospect of restrictions on so many of their own products. In an attempt to stop the U.S., other countries threatened to impose restrictions of their own if Smoot-Hawley passed. Some countries, like Canada, wrote up their own protectionist legislation, while others simply said that they would boycott U.S. products. Nonetheless, in 1929, the Smoot-Hawley Bill became law, the first shot in a global trade war. Between 1929 and 1932, the total volume of world trade fell from a total value of about $3 billion to only $1 billion, making Smoot-Hawley one of the major contributing factors to the Great Depression. Europe was soon embroiled in World War II, with the U.S. to follow. After the war, countries around the world agreed that perhaps the trade brawl had been a mistake that ought not to be repeated, and many of them sat down and formed an agreement to begin scaling back the tariff restrictions. This was the birth of the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, or GATT. At their highest, around 1930, the average level of tariffs on traded goods was at about 70%, nearly doubling the prices on imported goods. With the first full round of GATT in 1947, tariffs were reduced to about 40%, and then reduced further with each subsequent round. By 1993, 
GATT was in its ninth round, the Uruguay round, and tariffs were down to about 2-3% to average on traded goods. Here's the thing, though. Just because governments have agreed to cut tariffs, does this mean that the weak domestic industries stop wanting protection? No. So if you sign an agreement that says your country won't use tariffs, does this necessarily mean that no protection will be used? No. In fact, with the decline in tariffs came an increase in quotas. So then GATT began to address quotas. With the decline in quotas came an increase in the use of voluntary export restraints, VERs, or other non-tariff barriers, NTBs, like health and safety restrictions. Take a look at the duration of each round. Do you notice that each round gets longer and longer? That's because, one, it gets harder and harder to trim the fat. Two, the most contentious products, usually agriculture, kept getting put on the back burner. And three, the Uruguay round was the first to try to deal with the trade restrictions placed on services. Back when GATT started, it was dealing only with hard goods like cars and refrigerators. Trade and financial services, technical consulting and the like didn't appear until later. It took the better part of nine years to complete the Uruguay round, and when it was done, not only were there reductions in protection, but also the old GATT was gone. It evolved into the World Trade Organization, or WTO. The WTO is meant to serve as a place for trade dispute mediation. If one country has a complaint about another country's trade policies, that complaint can be heard by the WTO. Here's an interesting tidbit from The Economist magazine. As of 2009, the U.S. was the single most challenged country, i.e., the country that has had the most complaints lodged against it for unfair trade policies. However, we are also the single largest complaining nation. The U.S. has lodged more complaints against other countries than any other single nation. Let's know the meaning of GATT and non-tariff barriers. The history of the multilateral trade negotiations dealing with non-tariff barriers is brief. Multilateral trade negotiations are conducted under the auspices of the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, GATT, which was created shortly after World War II. GATT, a term that encompasses the multilateral agreement governing international trade, the bodies administering the agreement and all associated trade-related activities, has focused on the reduction of tariff rather than non-tariff barriers. To date, rounds of GATT negotiations have been completed, with the first six concerned almost exclusively with tariffs. The Tokyo Round the Tokyo Round, the most recently completed round lasting from 1973 to 1979, was a comprehensive effort to reduce trade obstacles stemming from tariffs and non-tariff measures. New or reinforced agreements called codes were reached on the following non-tariff measures. Subsidies and countervailing duties, government procurement, technical standards, import licensing procedures, customs valuation and anti-dumping. The Code on Subsidies and Countervailing Duties prohibits direct export subsidies except under certain situations in agriculture. This code is noteworthy in extending GATT's prohibition of export subsidies to trade in raw materials. Because nearly all governments subsidize domestic producers, to some extent, the code established criteria to distinguish between a domestic and an export subsidy. Domestic subsidies that treat domestic and export activities identically are generally allowed. Countervailing duties, which are tariffs to offset a subsidy received by a foreign exporter, are prohibited unless the subsidized goods are shown to be causing or threatening material injury to a domestic producer. This code also allows a country to seek redress for cases in which another country's subsidized exports displace its exports in third country markets. The Code on Government Procurement states that for qualifying non-military purchases, governments including the government-controlled entities, must treat foreign and domestic producers alike. In addition to resolving disputes, the court establishes procedures for opening and awarding bids. The Code on Technical Standards attempts to ensure the technical regulations and product standards such as labeling, safety, pollution and quality requirements do not create unnecessary obstacles to trade. The code does not specify standards, however, it establishes rules for setting standards and resolving disputes. The code on import licensing procedures, similar to the code on technical standards, is not spelled out in detail. Generally speaking, governments stated their commitment to simplify the procedures that importers must follow to obtain licenses. Reducing delays in licensing and paperwork are two areas of special interest. 
the Uruguay round. The Tokyo round codes have relied on good faith compliance, which has tended to undermine their effectiveness. Streamlining and resolving disputes is a priority during the current round of multilateral negotiations. The Uruguay round. The Tokyo round codes will be reviewed and possibly modified during the Uruguay round. In particular, broadening the government procurement code to include service contracts will be discussed. Concerning the technical standards code, agreements dealing with the mutual acceptance of test data generated by other parties and the openness of the activities of standard bodies will be sought. A major issue in the anti-dumping code is how to handle input dumping. The Uruguay round begun in September 1986 has and will discuss a member of non-tariff barrier issues, many of which extend beyond the codes of the Tokyo round. Trade issues involving agriculture and services, banking, construction, insurance and transportation are of paramount importance. The United States has proposed the elimination of all trade and production distorting agricultural policies, while the major agricultural nations have agreed to the principles of liberalizing agriculture. The sweeping nature of the US proposal has been resisted by some nations, especially the European community. With respect to services, the primary goal is to establish principles for extending GATT coverage to this trade. The concept of dumping. Dumping is when an identical product is sold at a lower price in the foreign market than in the in-home market. The definition also includes unusual situations where the same product is sold at a higher price in the foreign market than in the home market, known as reverse dumping, and the situation where the price of the product is different in the various foreign markets. The main aspect is that an organization charges a different price in different markets for the same product and this is price discrimination. The difference between general price discrimination and dumping is that dumping occurs in an international market between countries. Today the economic analysis of dumping is mainly focusing on the situation where the product is sold at a lower price in a foreign market than in a domestic market, since anti-dumping law only deals with this situation. The concept of dumping has also been extended to include sales the cost of production, not taking into account if there is a price discrimination or not in different national markets. The effects of dumping. Both anti-dumping supporters and opponents agree that dumping always benefits the consumers of the importing country. Dumping results in cheap imported products and this causes the country's market prices to decrease. The European Commission dumped imports are usually cheaper than the competitive products in the importing country. Even if the prices of the dumped imports are not lower, the additional products on the market can force down the price level. In both cases, the consumers in the importing country will benefit from the lower prices of the commodities. Did you know? The concept of dumping was first introduced by Jacob Weiner in his study, Dumping is a Problem in International Trade, in 1923. An organization is said to be dumping a product if it exports the product at a lower price than it charges in its home market. There are different opinions whether this is unfair competition or not. Anti-dumping is a counteractive measure that the government uses to defend domestic industries when dumping occurs. Anti-dumping actions are supposed to protect the domestic industries from injuries. The interest of consumers and the public interest of a nation can be hurt by dumping as well as the imposed anti-dumping measures. The public interest is affected by the measures changing the competition and the price of the product in the importing country. The WTO agreement does not pass judgment, but it provides guidelines to how a government can or cannot respond to dumping. The Anti-Dumping Code authorizes the government to react when dumping causes material injury to the domestic industry. For the government to be able to take actions, it has to do a serious investigation according to the code. The investigation has to show that dumping occurs, analyze the degree of dumping and show that it causes injury or it threatens to do so. If the analysis shows that dumping is taking place, then an anti-dumping action is allowed. An action usually means imposing a duty on the imports from the specific country to bring its price closer to the normal value. An anti-dumping measure can only be applied for five years unless an investigation shows that a removal of the duty will cause injury. 
important is that the anti-dumping code says that the member countries must quickly and in, in detail notify the committee on anti-dumping practices. If taking preliminary and final anti-dumping actions, the investigations must also be reported twice a year. The effects of anti-dumping measures. A country that is exposed to dumping will benefit from the lower prices. The consumers of the important country will have a larger consumer surplus since they have access to a larger supply of the goods to a lower price. These consumers' benefits will be lost when the importing countries imposes an anti-dumping measure on the low-priced imports. When the duties are levied on the imports, the products will have the same price level in both domestic and the foreign market. When the prices increase in the foreign market, the supply will decrease and the producers will have to comply with an inefficient low level of output. The consumers in the importing country have to pay a higher price for the products and have less consumer surplus. Other customers will not pay the higher price and are driven out of the market, which leads to a dead weight social cost. Imposing an anti-dumping measure will cause all the consumers and the industrial user benefits from dumping to disappear. The importing country will drive the dumped products out of the market if the anti-dumping duties are high enough or the product might remain in the market at higher prices. If the dumped products leave the market, the domestic firms are able to raise their prices due to lesser competition. Many of the necessary ingredients for U.S. production are imported. These intermediate goods help create final products and typically account for more than half of the value of all imports into the United States. That means of all the stuff Americans buy from abroad, more than half goes into products that Americans make. When low prices of these imports squeeze the profits of domestic suppliers, foreign competitors are often accused of dumping their products in U.S. markets. Anti-dumping rules are supposed to protect domestic producers and domestic jobs from unscrupulous foreign competition. But access to these inputs at lower cost means lower prices for consumers. Anti-dumping rules raise prices for consumers and producers, shrink profits, and reduce the capacity of firms to invest, expand, and hire more workers. Consider Dow Corning. Dow Corning makes silicones, a crucial component of solar panels, and a crucial component of silicones is silicon metal. But because of anti-dumping duties that prevent cheap imports, Dow Corning has to pay double the world price for silicon metal, all in the name of protecting domestic producers. For some reason, U.S. anti-dumping rules prohibit administrators from considering the interests of downstream industries like Dow Corning, who would be most negatively affected by punitive trade rules. Dow Corning even tried to get its facilities in Kentucky declared a foreign trade zone so they could buy their inputs on the world market. That request was effectively denied. Consider also Spartan Light Metal Products. A small Midwestern producer of engine parts, Spartan's biggest customers were looking to reduce the weight of their vehicles to improve fuel efficiency. So Spartan shifted from producing aluminum parts to products made from lighter, more durable magnesium. Spartan was doing well in the U.S. and exporting to other countries. But in February 2004, an anti-dumping petition against imports of magnesium from China and Russia was filed by the U.S. industry, which was comprised of just one producer, U.S. Magnesium Corporation of Utah. The price Spartan paid for magnesium more than tripled. Higher prices in the U.S. gave parts makers in Europe, China, and elsewhere a huge advantage. American suppliers went out of business. Downstream producers shed thousands of jobs, five times more jobs than even exist in the entire domestic magnesium producing industry. Adding insult to injury, both magnesium and silicon metal are among the nine minerals targeted by the United States in a World Trade Organization complaint against Chinese raw material export restrictions. That's right. The official policy of the U.S. government is to oppose Chinese restrictions on silicon metal and magnesium exports while imposing its own anti-dumping restrictions on both raw materials from China. In the end, rules meant to protect American producers are actually nudging companies like Dow Corning to move operations offshore. That destroys jobs in the United States and makes the U.S. less attractive for investment. The World Trade Organization there is an elaborate set of regulations surrounding the use of anti-dumping measures. This segment will give a brief introduction to the procedures that need to be followed in order for a tariff implementation. 
The World Trade Organization WTO allows for some expectations from the principles of binding tariffs and applying them equally to all trading partners, most favored nations treatment or MFN. One of these exceptions is that actions against dumping are allowed under certain circumstances. The WTO does not pass judgment when it comes to anti-dumping, but it instead focuses on how governments cannot react to dumping. However, the WTO disciplines anti-dumping actions and this is usually referred to as the Anti-Dumping Agreement, although the formal name is the Agreement on Implementation. In broad definition, the WTO agreement allows governments to act against dumping where there is genuine injury to the competing domestic industry or the dumping threatens to materially retard the establishment of a domestic industry. According to the agreement, in order to do so, a government must be able to prove that dumping in fact is taking place, calculate the extent of dumping and show that the dumping is causing injury or threatening to do so. The General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade GATT, that allows countries to act against dumping. This is clarified and expanded by the Anti-Dumping Agreement. The two agreements work together on the issue and let countries take actions that usually would break the GATT principles of binding a tariff and not discriminating particular trading partners. Now in the end, let us summarize what we have learned in this lecture. A tariff is a tax imposed on foreign goods as they enter a country. Non-tariff barriers, on the other hand, are non-tax measures imposed by governments to favor domestic over foreign supplies. Voluntary export restraints, which are nearly identical to quotas, are agreements between an exporting and an importing country, limiting the maximum amount of exports in either value or quantity terms to be sold within a given period. Variable import levies are special charges set to equalize the import price of a product with the domestic target price. The supply and demand analysis of quotas and voluntary export restraints highlights the difference per unit of import between what domestic and foreign consumers pay. The interest of consumers and the public interest of a nation is hurt by dumping as well as the imposed anti-dumping measures. The importing country drives the dumped products out of the market if the anti-dumping duties are high enough or the product might remain in the market at a higher price. The World Trade Organization WTO allows for some exceptions from the principle of binding tariffs and applying them equally to all trading partners.